<laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Steve Oaken. Great to see you back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Mr. COVID. Happy New Year, Neil. <laughs> Really, yes, it does feel that way. It does feel that way. And, I, and I'm, Steve, feel free to rip him at every opportunity. Oh. Because, because it's, it, 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 if you knew what was going on behind the scenes here, I tell you, but it's all part of the fun. Happy New Year to you, Mr. Oaken. Uh. It's great to be back with uh, with the three of us, even though we're we're not all together. But but it, good enough for the start of, of 2022, and hopefully it'll end a lot better than it's beginning. And, you know, I have to give a shout out, Steve, before we get into our our segment proper to you, because you gave me one of the best tips of our trip in the U.S., and that was take the Amtrak train between New York City and Richmond, Virginia, which were two of our destinations. We did it there and back, and it was magnificent. We avoided airports. We avoided the TSA. We had a great ride, and it was, uh, of course, people in the Northeast know about that Northeast corridor, those trains, but... Boy, what a great opportunity to see a little bit of the country and uh, and really about the same amount of time it would have taken us to fly. You know, and it, look, and it is certainly in 2022 is also going to be the year of ESG and train travel is just so much more environmentally sustainable than, than, than air traffic uh, as well. So there's so many more reasons to hit the rails, you know, when you visit the U.S. who's ever who's ever going sometime, hopefully this year from uh, from Singapore. Think about think about Amtrak both in the Northeast Corridor, but but across the country. Fantastic. It's just a shame you couldn't give him any tips on COVID. <laughs> but, <laughs> but moving well, on, Steve. Have everything, moving, Neil. No, exactly. <laughs> moving on, Steve. Big deal. Yeah, big announcement this week, of course, or a big deal this week. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, a mega trade agreement signed by 15 countries, of course, including Singapore, collectively covers about one-third of the world's population, what does it mean for the region and obviously more specifically Singapore? Well, like this is the, as you, it's the world's largest uh, FTA. Mm. Um, and look, over time, this agreement is going to address supply chain bottlenecks uh, and resilience in the pandemic era for those countries that are members, including Japan, China, and all 10 countries of, of Southeast Asia. It's going to allow uh, businesses to create more resilient supply chains. Um, because you're going to be able to have, you know, you can have manufacturing in one country, you can have sourcing in multiple countries, you don't have to worry about, you know, meeting, you know, specific rules of origin and, and having different customs duties. So it is, it's a big deal, especially on the manufacturing side, a little less so on, on the services side. So this is really a, a, a trade agreement uh, in Asia for Asia. Steve, when we look at RCEP, it's, you know, it's been talked about, as, as you mentioned, for many years now, over a decade. And, uh, and ASEAN has really been struggling to try to get the rules uh, lined up for everybody to agree on because of the differences in, in the economies in, in the countries in, just within ASEAN. Um, how, what, were, what were the sort of final things that got this over the, you know, over the goal line? What, what were the comp- uh, countries uh, saying anyway that they, that they believed would be the, the best uh, reason to go forward? Well, I mean, I think two things. One was that this is a, and I said, this is a lower standard agreement than something like the, the CPTPP, you know, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That is a very high level to meet when it comes to the environment, when it comes to labor, uh, when it mm. comes to opening up your markets more comprehensively. This doesn't do that. So this this takes into account that there are members uh, of, of RCEP, like Laos and Cambodia, uh, that would never be able to meet the, the requirements of TPP. So that's one difference, is that it, it's somewhat of a lower standard. Um, but it, it's also important to to be integrated and when you had the tpp with some southeast asian members like singapore and vietnam and malaysia who were members but philippines uh, thailand and you know lao and cambodia who are not they needed to get a trade agreement too so this is an important trade agreement um it also recognizes while the standards aren't quite as high as tpp they're still significant when it comes to reducing customs duties uh when you have one set of rules and it also has phase-ins so a country like Singapore is going to have to implement some things immediately, whereas a country like Cambodia might take 
10 years or 20 years even to, to, to meet some of those agreements. Uh, so so it, it takes that into account, Glenn, which is why it got past, past the finish line. And Steve, what do we see or what do you see from a, a political perspective here that, um, you know, this has been widely seen as a geopolitical victory for China. And of course, we've talked about many, many times on this show, the supposed waning economic influence of the United States in this particular reason. I mean, in, in this particular region, do you see that yourself, that this is a kind of uh, geopolitical victory for China? Well, it, it's it's a it's a geopolitical victory for for Asia, in which of course includes China, um, and the U.S. has waning influence because the U.S. chooses not to participate in trade agreements because the U.S. withdrew uh, from from the TPP because the U.S. hasn't engaged in the types of digital trade agreements that it should be engaging with uh, in 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 Asia. So the waning influence is not because China's doing better; it's because the U.S. Uh, has pulled out. This is a big deal, Neil, for those reasons, because this is the first trade agreement in which China, Japan, and Korea are all members. So you're going to see this integration in North Asia. Um, you're going to see uh, more trade coming down between Southeast Asia and China uh, and, and than you would have otherwise. Um, don't forget, of course, it includes Australia and, and New Zealand as well. So yeah, this is, this is a big win politically, but it's not because of what China's done so much is is what the U.S. is not doing. Steve, let's move forward uh, to the January 6th anniversary of the storming of the Capitol in the U.S. Uh, just a year ago. Uh, a, a tumultuous time in the U.S. on that day, of course, and since uh, the Democrats trying to get this, uh, their uh, report put together, they're having their hearings, etc. cetera. Uh, Republicans are stonewalling it. Where do we stand now? Uh, Biden came out with some very strong words on the anniversary against Trump and and, and the whole situation. Where, where are we at now that we're two days past the anniversary and we can look back on it uh, with a little bit of uh, clarity? Well, I'm telling you, Glenn, what, what is utterly depressing and, and frightening uh, is that we're actually worse off a year after the the violent attack on democracy than we were on that day that a, a second attack if it were to come is more likely to succeed I'm not saying it will come or that it's it's likely to come but if it does come around the 2024 election it's more likely to succeed uh, um, and that's because why do you say that steve yeah it, it's because what has occurred in the past year is that you have had attacks on democracy in the states that are succeeding, right? So what happened on January 6th is that the president, President Trump called his supporters to Washington to stop the steal and save America. And they were to march to the Congress and to demand that Congress not certify the election. That is not possible under the Constitution. Under the Constitution, the, the Congress cannot substitute its judgment for what the state's have certified and the states follow right whoever gets the most votes wins and it's because you had republican governors like those in arizona uh in georgia and you had republican secretaries of state like like the one in georgia who certified that their state voted for joe biden that's why joe biden became president and now many states are changing their laws where the state legislature can overrule the secretary of state and say no there was fraud even though you certify the election we're going to give mm -hmm. it to donald trump and not joe biden and you know i say that was the rematch in 2024 when that certification goes to congress congress can't do anything about it so what is going to so you're going to now have a system in place in states that never existed before where there can be a partisan overruling of of, of state officials on who won an election and that's why we're worse off today than we were a year ago because these attacks on democracy are continuing they did not stop on january 6th fascinating and yet singapore wasn't invited to the re recent <laughs> <laughs> democracy summit but let's not go there but on that point on that point uh, steve some statistics here that i find absolutely mind-boggling a year on a year on two-thirds of republican voters still believe that the election was stolen 
two thirds, despite 60 different court judgments ruling otherwise. And a survey shows that 30 percent of Republicans, this is in The Guardian today, a survey shows that 30 percent of Republicans say that true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save our country. Last point on that. The editor of The New Yorker, uh, you know, a publication not known for being hysterical. The editorial said this week uh, discussed the possibility of a second American civil war. This was an editorial in The New Yorker talking about a second American civil war. Are these commentaries, analysis hysterical or is this a real situation? Where's your view on this? Look, it, it's a real situation, and uh, all of those things are unlikely to occur. But, but unlikely things do occur in history, right? The Titanic was not so. So was to the say. storming of the Capitol on January the sixth. That was very unlikely as well, wasn't it? <laughs> right, and so you have unlikely events that are very high impact. This happens yeah. throughout history, and so that is why it is so important to talk about it. It's so important to say what is going on and. What is lacking is that we're not having a bipartisan agreement on this. There was supposed to be a bipartisan commission um, to investigate January 6th, like we had in the United States after 9-11. We had Democrats, Republicans mm. came together, said, what happened? Why did it happen? And what are we going to do to prevent it again? We were supposed to do the same on January 6th. The Republican leader in the House refused to cooperate. Um, and so you have two Republicans who have been ostracized basically from the party, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, cooperating. You have Republicans stonewalling this 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 uh, select committee, but you have others who are cooperating. Supposedly, Vice President Pence's office is very much cooperating with this. So let's hope this January 6th committee can come out with some recommendations that people on both sides can agree need to get done so that whoever wins in 2024, be it the Democrat or the Republican, is recognized as the true leader of the United States by by the entire country, which is not happening, Neil, as you pointed out right now. Yeah, just briefly, there's a there's a, a, a fantastic black comedy on uh on HBO Go right now, HBO Plus, called The Second Civil War. And it was from 1997, a black comedy made for HBO about uh, states seceding from the U.S. and National Guards and, and militia taking over and fighting against the central government. It, it was as frightening as it was funny. Uh, James Earl Jones and Dennis Leary and and a bunch of uh, uh, other folks uh, in that movie. So if you're if you're looking to see how um, art may imitate real life, um, I would suggest that that might be one movie that actually has a little bit more truth than uh, what we'd like to uh, admit to at at this moment in time. All right, let's uh, let's go on to another uh, story, our final story today, and it is one that is absolutely true and happening right now, and that is Djokovic down under and uh, the the tennis. Um, wow, debacle that's happening uh, with the with the open there. Uh, set this up for us, Steve. There's there's a lot going on. There's a lot to unpack with this. And now a Czech tennis player whose visa has also been canceled. All right, I'll give this. This is not hard to set up. But the Australian Open's only been happening since 1905. Right? This is not news <laughs> that there is going to be a tennis event, a Grand Slam in Australia in January every year. Everybody knew this was coming. Everybody knew that, that, that Djokovic is notoriously not vaccinated um, and that he says it should be your personal choice. Everybody knew this was coming. The Australian you know, tennis set up an exemption process. Um, Djokovic uh, applied for an exemption. He received that exemption. Um, and then the Australian government has, has, has stepped in and overruled its, its, its own people. And... That is where we stand right now. And so the question is, uh, should they have done this? Should they have overruled um, what should have, you know, what was what was granted to Djokovic? So that's question number one. And then question number two is, you could say, should he, should this even be a medical issue? Should, it, should an exemption be given to him? Because, look, he has won, you know, as many Grand Slams as anyone alive. There's three people who've won 20. He's one of the three. Of course, it's Federer and Dollar, the others. Uh, 
He has won the last three. He's won nine of these Australian Opens. If he wins here, this is going to be the biggest Australian Open probably in in in, a, in probably a, a decade or so in terms of coverage and and the like. And so, should he have been if, if granted an exemption, I think you could have made that point clear that we want him here and let's put him in different protocols. Um, they didn't do that. Instead, they went the, the medical route, and now they're backtracking. And I think the Australian government looks way worse uh, than Djokovic. I, I think this is a fiasco. It's a debacle. You can use whatever words you want. And I don't think any of that should be applying to Djokovic. He didn't do anything wrong in this case. Well, Steve, this is the interesting part, isn't it? I mean, I lived in uh, Australia for five years, and there's a couple of things here. The, the, the strange intricacies between federal and state government, that seems to be playing out right now, between the Victorian state government and the national federal government. The second thing is, there is, um, how can I put this delicately, a mild paranoia in Australia when it comes to borders and closed borders and open borders and being swamped. It's part of the national psyche, this idea that the, this island is constantly being swamped. So there, there is a political element as well, Steve, isn't there? There are federal elections coming up, I believe, uh, so in the next four months or so. Prime Minister Scott Morrison, in his speech about Djokovic, if he said the word borders once, he must have said it a dozen times. Borders, 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 border policy, strong borders. It plays strong to his demographic, doesn't it, to keep emphasizing a strong border policy with no exceptions for anyone. They even did this a few years ago with Johnny Depp's dogs. So then, you know, when it comes to entrance into a country and quarantine and so on, there's a political element as well, Steve. Well, and that's, you know, and that's why I'm saying it's unfair to Djokovic. And then, Neil, you, you shock, right? Australia cares about its borders. Shock. That, that Australia has gone through, you know, in Melbourne in particular, I think the longest lockdown of any city outside of, of, of China, uh, and maybe even within China to have a lockdown. Everybody knew this was coming. Everybody knew that this was uh, uh, the, the number one tennis player in the entire world going to set the global record on Grand Slams. And so they should have, either, everybody saw this coming, and they should have either said, we are not going to allow any medical exemptions, <clears throat> for 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 Melbourne and in the into into Victoria or we're going to allow them but they're playing politics with this Neil and I don't think it I think it's completely transparent what they're doing as you mentioned and I think it's completely unfair to Djokovic that they have put him in this situation Christopher Chang uh, pointing out on Facebook live uh, that the, uh, about the Czech tennis player as well who's uh, who's now she had a, an appropriate, a proper medical exemption, and now hers is being revoked, uh, mentioned in the, in the sports segment this morning by Neil. Uh, but uh, this, to me, at, at first I was, I, I have to be honest with you, I was biased against Djokovic, and I thought, oh, what a prat. You know, here's, here's another big sports star thinking he can flout the rules. But then as you read the story about him and the Czech player, you know, they went through... And, you know, they applied for the exemption. They apparently got the exemptions through the proper channels in Australia. And now it's the internal Australian authorities, uh, the checkpoint or border folks uh, that are fighting with each other. And so it looks worse for it makes Australia look worse than it does the tennis players in my in my reading of the situation. Does that seem appropriate? No, that's exactly appropriate. And, and, and the, the Australians could have done one of two things. Like, look what they what they do in the NFL, right? In in America, where you have you know maybe the greatest quarterback today, you know Aaron Rodgers for the Green Bay Packers in terms of, of current play, he is unvaccinated, and so they have different rules for uh, the unvaccinated than the vaccinated. He's supposed to wear his mask more often. He gets tested more often. He he needs to isolate longer if he gets COVID. And so they said we're going to have different rules for the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. Australia could have said one of two things. They could have said, we're gonna have different rules for the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. We're gonna welcome Djokovic in and other tennis players who choose not to get a vaccine, which is legal. Um, or they could have said, we're gonna have a zero tolerance policy. You wanna come into our country, you have to be vaccinated. Um, mm. And they set up mm. a process to give an exemption to that second standard. And then Djokovic and all the tennis players, they all lived up to that process. It's not Johnny Depp sneaking in his dog exactly, for Johnny exactly. Depp on, on an airplane. And so yeah. that is why I think there's justifiable anger, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, from, from Djokovic, from his fans, from the president of his country <laughs> against the Australians for playing politics with this. Yeah. 
Well, finally, Steve, talking about anger, we must bring our international news review back to Singapore. A prominent, I thought respected, family this week was seen on social media trashing up with hammers and sledgehammers. This room in Singapore smashing it to pieces. I thought it was front page news. Steve, what's the story here? But yeah, so so you know, uh, Bennett, you know, and, and and Mason are back from college, and we said, "What do you want to do uh, when you're here for for the you know when when you're here?" And they, you know, said, "Do you want to take a you know cruise to nowhere? Uh, do you want to you know you know do something you know? Are there places you want to see in Singapore we could do as a family?" And they said, "We want to go to the fragment room." And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> and so. There's this business in, in Singapore, uh, and it's called the Fragment Room because you break things uh, into fragments. And, and you break, you can break TVs, you break glasses, you break, uh, you, you, you break any printers, all these electronics and, and glass, and you can use, you can throw them against walls, you can use baseball bats, you can use crowbars, you can use lead pipes. It's so much fun. Uh, that that uh, it, it, it for the for the whole family and so yeah we had a, a great time I never even knew it existed here and I've told people about it and they've already made uh, reservations to go to to break things have fun and you know you get a little get a little of your aggression out. It sounds Fantastic. like one of those couples therapy places, right? Yeah, <laughs> the couples go and they start breaking stuff to take out their uh, anxiety or whatever. Yeah. It sounds like this office. It sounds like this office. <laughs> Dan has broke two laptops, a microphone. No, he hasn't really. He's, he's giving me eyes off camera. Well, guys, uh, we've got to wrap it up there. Thank yeah. you very much indeed, Steve. Try not to break anything else with your family. I'll be seeing you next week, so I look forward to that. Thanks as always. Steve, you want to go ahead? Neil, my, my Let It Be shirt. You didn't say anything. Oh, there Come you on. go. Oh, there, there you go. In celebration my, my, of Get Back, currently exactly. showing on Disney+, Plus, one of the great shows showing at the moment. Do watch it at the weekend if you haven't seen it. Steve Okin, as always, thank you very much, my friend. Happy Thanks, New Steve. Year. All right. See you soon. <laughs>